So welcome everybody to our Wicked seminar series. I am excited to introduce Carolyn Boder. Uh, many of you I'm sure know she was hired um, as part of the water security cluster hire and also part of Project Wicked. So we're really excited that uh, she's coming to UD. She um, will be joining us in January. She'll be faculty in civil and environmental engineering and she'll have a joint appointment in earth sciences. Um, she has a lot of different research interests um, in sustainable and resilient communities, coupled natural human systems, ecosystem services, urban eco hydrology, green infrastructure, stormwater management, et cetera. Um, so, uh, I think we're all excited to work with you, Carolyn, on, on some of these things. Um, some background on Carolyn, she has a BS in civil engineering from Bucknell and a PhD in civil and environmental engineering from the University of, University of Wisconsin-Madison. She is currently serving as a Wisconsin Water Resources Science Policy Fellow, and she's just finishing that up before she joins us in January. So. Carolyn's, I think, going to tell us about some of the work that she's been doing as a science policy fellow. And I'm excited to hear that. So welcome, Carolyn. Yeah, and thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, uh, I'm excited to be joining UD soon. Um, and uh, today, you know, since I am a bit new to this community, I thought I'd um, start this talk by stepping back a bit and giving you a bit of a broader overview of who I am as a researcher. Holly mentioned several of my interests. Um, but I've, I've mentioned to some of you, I consider myself an ecohydrologic modeler. Um, and as an ecohydrologist, I'm interested in quantifying, describing the movement of water through several different spheres from groundwater and saturated zone processes uh, to vetostone and unsaturated flow processes to surface water, be that streams or lakes or overland flow to vegetation into the atmosphere. Um, and I study, quantify, and describe the fluxes of water through these systems across the natural, uh, agricultural, and built environments. And as a modeler, um, my expertise is uh, largely in physically based hydrologic models such as PARFLOW, uh, which really integrate a lot of these ecohydrologic processes I just described together. I've also spent some time with high throughput, high performance computing systems, which help me uh, increase the size and quantity of the models that I run in order to more thoroughly answer some of these questions that I have. Uh, and of course, I also spend a bit of time with high level coding languages, uh, be that R, mod, um, MATLAB, Python, uh, for pre or post processing files associated with these physically based models, but also for synthesizing empirical data, um, as I spent a lot of time doing for the project I'm talking about today. Uh, and in my mind, uh, the work I've done and I'm doing can be clustered into these two broad categories. Um, so uh, urban ecohydrology and resilient communities and surface water groundwater interactions and sustainable agriculture. And today I'm going to be focused um, uh, mostly on, on this work here, uh, but before I end, I'll also try to circle back and touch on kind of at a high level some of the urban ecohydrology work that I've done and am doing. So uh, hopefully that kickstarts some conversations in that area as well. So uh, as I understand it, Project WICKED is centered around water security, uh, or this capacity of society to safeguard sustainable access to adequate quantities of acceptable quality water to sustain livelihoods, well-being, socioeconomic development, protect against waterborne pollution and water-related disasters, preserve ecosystems. And as I understand it, uh, Project WICKED is particularly focused on assessing threats and developing solutions for the water quality part of this. Um, I think particularly as it relates to nitrate and salinity, um, and particularly as they relate to the agricultural industry, which is a critical component of Delaware's economy. So the project that I'm going to talk about today is focused on the Wisconsin Central Sands, uh, which is a very aptly named region in the central part of Wisconsin. Uh, and it's characterized by a large unconfined sand and gravel aquifer. Uh, this aquifer supports a large potato and vegetable growing industry, which is a central part of Wisconsin's economy, uh, as well as 800 miles of trout stream, 300 lakes, uh, which are popular destinations for fishing and recreation. And groundwater quality is a concern in this area. Uh, groundwater is the main source of drinking water in Wisconsin, and nitrate is the most widespread groundwater contaminant uh, in Wisconsin. And this issue is only increasing in extent and severity. 
But an arguably more contentious issue in this area uh, has been the steady expansion of high capacity wells for irrigation ever since the 1960s. And much of these high capacity wells have been concentrated in the central sands. Uh, and whenever water levels are low, concerns are raised about um, the impacts that groundwater withdrawals are having on these water resources. So for the, this wicked water problem that I'm going to be focused on here today, um, the aspect of water security that we're most focused on is assessing threats and developing solutions uh, for the water quantity piece of this, uh, in particular, how we can um, balance uh, preserving ecosystems and sustaining livelihoods in this region. Um, there's been a roller coaster of uh, scientific studies and court cases and changing policies related to um, on this topic in the central sands ever since the 1960s. Uh, but most recently, this debate led to 2017 Wisconsin Act 10, which charged the DNR with determining whether existing and potential groundwater withdrawals are causing or likely to cause a significant reduction of lake water levels below average seasonal levels uh, at three specific lakes in the central sands, Pleasant Lake, Long Lake, and Plainfield Lake. Um, and all three of these lakes in the central sands, Lake Steady, are seepage lakes. Uh, so there are no streams entering or leaving these lakes. Uh, and because there's no streams and there's also very little surface runoff due to the sandy soils, uh, these uh, lake levels are uh, primarily controlled by just two factors, the weather and the amount of groundwater entering and leaving the lake. And it's easy for uh, stakeholders in this region to uh, simplify this to just one of the two, to say that lake levels are only controlled by weather or that they're only controlled by uh, the changes in groundwater caused by groundwater withdrawals. But of course, it's a both and. Uh, weather and uh, groundwater withdrawals are always simultaneously influencing lake levels. Uh, and one of the challenges we had in this study was to untangle those and look at just the impact from groundwater withdrawals alone. And I also uh, want to mention that this focus on lakes in the Central Sands Lake Study um, is, is notable because groundwater uh, withdrawals affect lakes differently than they affect streams. Uh, streams tend to be much shallower and it's possible for a single high capacity well to have a sing um, significant impact on a stream. Uh, but it may take dozens of high capacity wells to have the same kind of impact on a lake. So it's um, more complicated to assess what the impact might be on a lake. Uh, and even if you can assess the drawdown, it's still kind of an open question uh, that you're left with, which is how much water level decline is too much in a lake. Um, because streams are thought to be more sensitive, that's where most of our scientific understanding lies. Um, and lake response to declining water levels in lakes is a real gap in our knowledge. So I think of this as a classic wicked water problem. Uh, it's a hot button issue. It's stymied policymakers and managers for decades. We've had a ton of scientific studies in this area, but our understanding still incomplete in some critical ways. Um, but 2017 Wisconsin Act 10 told the DNR, just figure it out in four years, <laughs> um, at least for these three lakes in this uh, Central Sands Lake study. Uh, and I think there's a number of reasons why the DNR was able to pull this off, not the least of which is a really great team within the DNR itself. Uh, there's also a great longstanding relationship between the DNR and modeling experts at the USGS Midwest Water Science Center that was critical. But one of the resources that the DNR turned to uh, was this Wisconsin Water Resources Science Policy Fellowship Program. And this program began um, not too long ago, around 2015, 2016. Uh, it's been working to build capacity for co-productive science in the state of Wisconsin. And co-productive science is uh, where researchers and practitioners uh, collaborate to ask questions, uh, design and implement the studies, um, and identify options for action that uh, appropriately are using the science and putting that science into action. Uh, we have a paper coming out in December that describes this fellowship program in a little bit more detail and suggests how it might be able to be applied to different regions. Uh, but in a nutshell, uh, this program in Wisconsin is hosted by the jointly administered Wisconsin Sea Grant and USGS funded Wisconsin Water Resources Institute, uh, where Jen Hawkswell oversees research. Uh, and every year she um, uh, connects with uh, colleagues at one or more state agencies that are dealing with some kind of pressing water resources issue for which they could use some new expertise. Um, so in this case, uh, 
uh, Adam Freihofer, who uh, is, um, leads the program that was charged with implementing the Central Sands Lake study, reached out to Jen and together they crafted the fellowship position um, that I was ultimately hired for. Um, and like all the other fellows in this program, I am an employee of uh, UW-Madison with all the benefits and resources that come with that, uh, but I'm stationed at the DNR and I work on a day-to-day -day basis with colleagues there. Um, other fellows have been placed uh, in Wisconsin at the Department of Health Services working on groundwater standards for PFAS or in the coastal management program working with coastal communities on coastal hazards. Um, at this point, I think we've had uh, over 24 fellows um, hosted by uh, over 18 different uh, host agency programs. So it's definitely a growing program. Uh, but in my fellowship specifically, um, with my colleagues at the DNR, I've worked primarily on tackling these two questions that are at the heart of 2017 Wisconsin Act 10 and the Central Sands Lake Study. So to what extent do groundwater withdrawals affect lake levels? And is this change then significant to the lake ecosystems? And significant is in quotes here because that was not defined by the statute. So that's a key part of what we were trying to do in this study is uh, figure out what that, what that would be. Uh, and our approach was to use our conceptual understanding of these seepage lakes, um, along with several years of field data, uh, to develop a groundwater flow model using soil water balance and mod flow. Um, this model development was led by these, our colleagues at the USGS, um, and it allowed us to untangle um, how groundwater withdrawals affect lake levels by running these three different scenarios to help us get at that first question. And then we uh, evaluated how these changes in lake levels would affect lake ecosystems in terms of human uses, uh, fish, uh, aquatic plants, and water chemistry. And this is the part that I was most involved in uh, and where we're answering that second question and ultimately addressing the ask in the statute, which is, is this change significant then to lake ecosystems? And for the sake of time, I'm gonna jump right into the meat of this uh, with the uh, modeled scenarios and uh, our evaluation of this lake ecosystem response. So uh, the statute specifically asked about the role of both uh, existing and potential groundwater withdrawals. Uh, so we designed three scenarios to evaluate this. And uh, in this region, 95 to 99% of all groundwater withdrawals are for irrigation. Uh, so we can also think of these as irrigated ag scenarios. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, these steady lakes are primarily controlled by two factors, weather and land use, and we're trying to untangle those two. So we use the exact same weather for all three of these scenarios uh, and only change land use. Uh, we use this 38 year time series of precipitation and temperature because it generally takes uh, a long time, at least 30 years to see the full range of high and low lake levels due to weather. And in the no irrigated ag scenario, uh, we replaced irrigated agriculture land use uh, and its associated groundwater withdrawals with a mix of forest and grassland, non irrigated ag and wetland land uses. And so that means this land use map is not historical, um, but it, it represents this plausible end member scenario um, that we can use to tease out the impacts of uh, irrigated agriculture and its associated groundwater withdrawals. This is basically allowing us to answer the question, how would lake levels vary due to weather alone in the absence of groundwater withdrawals? Uh, the current irrigated ag scenario is based on 2018 land use, uh, where we had crops following a four-year crop rotation schedule. Um, of course, this is also a little bit hypothetical because land use typically varies on timescales like decades, um, but this lets us get at the effect that existing uh, groundwater withdrawals are having on lake levels. And comparing this to, current, to the no irrigated ag scenario uh, lets us get at that question. And then this potential irrigated ag scenario is um, uh, a scenario where we, uh, any land that could be converted to irrigated ag is. Um, so we don't necessarily expect this to, to happen for sure in the future, but again, it's a useful end member scenario that allows us to get at the, um, how much change in lake levels could potentially occur. So we run these scenarios, we get different time series of lake levels for each of the three scenarios. Um, but that leaves us still with that million dollar question, is that change in lake levels significant to lake ecosystems? 
So in order to assess this, uh, for each of the four ecosystem categories that we looked at, um, we identified different lake levels or frequencies of lake levels um, that were relevant to different ecological indicators like boating, uh, water chemistry, uh, distribution of plant communities, um, or, or boating, things like this. So some of the ecosystem indicators that we looked at were the same across all lakes, um, such as the aerial um, extent of different plant communities or some aspects of water chemistry. But others were specific to each lake based on the field uh, work that we had done in our prior lake characterization here. So an example of this is that Pleasant Lake was the only lake that's big enough to permit motor boating or deep enough to stratify. Um, another example is that Plainfield Lake is the only lake that's generally fishless, so we didn't evaluate impacts to fish here. It's also primarily in a state natural area. Uh, it doesn't have very many homes along the shoreline, so we didn't evaluate human use impacts to docks here either. So there's some differences as well. Um, oops. All right, and a key concept um, in our analysis is that lake level variability is important to the health of these lake ecosystems. So among other effects, right, high levels uh, clear back upland vegetation, while low levels offer an opportunity for emergent plants and inland beach uh, plant communities to germinate. Uh, so to fully understand how a lake ecosystem is affected by lake levels, we can't just look at a static average level, which is what a lot of our stakeholders were expecting. We had to look at a full range of lake levels from infrequent low to infrequent high, uh, how long lake levels tend to stay high or low, how quickly lake levels rise or fall, um, and if there's predictability in the timing of relatively higher or lower levels on an annual or seasonal basis. Now, interestingly, when we evaluated these scenarios, they showed us that groundwater withdrawals um, mainly affect just one aspect, though, of these lake levels, just their magnitude. Uh, so what I'm showing here is time along the x-axis and lake elevation along the y-axis. Um, we have the uh, no irrigated ag lake levels in blue, current irrigated ag in yellow, potential irrigated ag in red. And you can see that lake levels vary over time in all scenarios, so that's the effect of weather. Uh, but current and potential irrigated ag shift these lake levels down. And after evaluating all of the lake uh, level metrics that we had identified. Um, we found that groundwater withdrawals generally did not alter how long lake levels tended to stay high or low relative to the median level. Um, they didn't alter how quickly lake levels rise or fall. They didn't alter the timing or predictability of lake levels. They really just drew the lake levels down by a fairly uniform amount over the entire time. Uh, and what was really helpful to our stakeholders was to walk through what this meant for each lake one at a time. So we can start with Pleasant Lake. So we can calculate the average lake level from that entire time series, and we would draw it like so for Pleasant Lake. Um, but we often saw that lake, uh, we saw that lake levels often go higher, and they often go lower than that average lake level. Um, even in the absence of groundwater withdrawals here. So what we can do is make note of what that uh, range and average lake level is for this no irrigated agriculture scenario. And that represents the amount that lake levels go up and down due to weather alone in the absence of groundwater withdrawals. We can make note of that range and average level and we'll put it to the side for later reference. Now, these levels can drop a bit before the levels get too low, um, uh, such that it starts to impact different aspects of the lake ecosystem. And after evaluating all of our ecosystem indicators, what we found is that lake levels can drop to here before the lake ecosystem starts to become impacted. So we can make note of this range and average level, put it over on the side here, and we can see that sure enough, lake levels can drop a little bit before you would start to expect an impact to the ecosystem. Now, this is the typical range and average level from the current irrigated agriculture scenario. When we compare this to our other levels, we can see that current irrigated ag does lower lake levels uh, relative to the no irrigated ag scenario, but it doesn't lower them below any of these significant impact thresholds. So, in other words, when we compare uh, the shift in water levels 
uh, to the significant lake level thresholds for each of the ecosystem indicators that we were evaluating, we're finding that the shift downward in lake levels uh, due to current irrigated ag isn't large enough that it's uh, impacting the lake ecosystem in terms of any of these 28 ecosystem indicators we evaluated. We did see though that uh, low lake levels um, uh, were near the, uh, within kind of the range of uncertainty um, in terms of uh, the tipping point at which the lake might become unstratified um, and become well mixed. Um, we also saw that under the potential irrigated ag scenario, there could be impacts to docks. Uh, so we concluded that caution's warranted here. Um, it's uh, not, not a green light exactly. So we can also um, take a look at Long Lake, which is a bit of a smaller lake higher in the landscape. Um, and here again, we can calculate that average lake level for the entire 30 plus year time series. Um, again, as at Long or Pleasant, we can have higher lake levels, we can have lower lake levels, and overall, even in the no irrigated ag scenario, we have some range um, around the average lake level. So again, this is the uh, amount we can expect lake levels to go up and down due to weather alone in the absence of groundwater withdrawals. So we'll put this to the side for a later reference here. And when we evaluated each of the ecosystem indicators at Long Lake, we found that uh, the lake levels could drop uh, a little bit to this average level in range before the lake ecosystem would be impacted at Long Lake. Um, so again, if we compare it to the no irrigated ag levels, they are just a little bit lower here. When we ran the current irrigated ag scenario, it showed that current irrigated ag uh, has an average lake level and range of lake levels down here. And comparing it, uh, we can see that this is clearly below the no irrigated ag um, scenario levels and also clearly below the significant impact thresholds. So at Long Lake, uh, we had 18 out of 19 ecosystem indicators clearly impacted by this downward shift in lake levels. Um, as some examples, the conditions shifted from often good for paddle sports to rarely appropriate for paddle sports. Um, it becomes similarly rare to have a good conditions for docks. Um, fish lose up to 90% of their physical habitat. Upland vegetation is encroaching lakeward. Um, water chemistry is the only aspect that's generally okay, except the very low lake levels. Um, and all of this is to say that the story at Long Lake is very different than at Plain, uh, Pleasant Lake. Uh, current irrigated ag uh, significantly impacts the lake ecosystem uh, in many ways. And uh, the potential irrigated ag scenario shows us that uh, it's possible that future uh, expansion of groundwater withdrawals could uh, further exacerbate this to the point that uh, we're seeing the lake completely dry over 10% of the time. So uh, for the sake of time, I won't go into the same level of detail for Plainfield, but it's generally a similar story, if uh, not quite as extreme as at Long Lake. Um, so overall, we're finding that Pleasant Lake is uh, not significantly impacted by current groundwater withdrawals, but there's this need for caution because it could be vulnerable to um, expanded groundwater withdrawals, while Long and Plainfield are currently impacted by uh, existing groundwater withdrawals. So uh, what I've described so far, I think all amounts to, um, in the language of Project Wicked, basically assessing the threat of groundwater withdrawals to these lake ecosystems. Um, but thanks to our co-productive approach, we were able to ask these questions and design this investigation in a way that uh, positioned the DNR to suggest management solutions um, that in some cases hadn't really been on the table before. So a key finding from this study was that the additive impact from many wells is what caused the significant impacts at Long and Plainfield Lake. Uh, it's very much a death by a thousand paper cuts type of situation. There's no one well that dominates in terms of impact. Um, and this idea that you know, one well has some impact, but multiple wells uh, lead to greater impacts uh, seems straightforward. Um, but until recently, the DNR has been prohibited from considering the cumulative impacts from other existing wells when they're faced with a new high capacity well application. They could only consider whether that well by itself was going to cause an impact. Um, so this study, um, gave the DNR the backing it needed to suggest to the legislature that 
uh, you know, because so many wells are contributing to drawdown at any one lake, it'd be impossible to evaluate um, uh, and truly manage this situation um, on a one well at a time basis. That what we really needed here is a regional water management approach, something like a water use district. Um, so in broad strokes, the current idea is that uh, such a district would involve the DNR, um, providing the science to assess the threat, much as they did in this study. Um, uh, then kind of putting that information in the hands of stakeholders to agree upon um, how to balance mitigating that ecological threat with uh, economic concerns. Um, then allowing landowners to choose from a menu of options for how they would work um, to meet those goals based on what model scenarios um, uh, anticipate would be effective. Uh, so these recommendations were just presented to the legislature in June. Um, so it's still TBD if the legislature is going to uh, move forward and create a district along these lines. Um, but it was, um, even if they don't, <laughs> it's still monumental um, in terms of allowing the DNR to get on the record saying, uh, here's how we want to manage this and here's why. Um, and of course, internally at the DNR, uh, what we're working on now is first uh, publishing what we've learned because that's really missing actually for these managers. Uh, they don't have peer reviewed science they can point to um, when it comes to how they should deal with lakes when they get that high cap uh, well application. And we're also working to kind of streamline this process um, and translate the lessons we learned from the Central Sands Lake study so that when they do get that high cap well application that's um, potentially impacting a lake, uh, they can move through um, a checklist of sorts and get to a reasonable answer of, yes, this is a pretty vulnerable lake, it's probably going to be impacted, or no, it's pretty robust and resilient, probably not going to be impacted uh, without having to spend four years with 30 scientists and a million dollars to kind of arrive at that answer. So I hope uh, that was um, an interesting dive into these um, threats and emerging solutions for a wicker water challenge that I see as having a lot of parallels to those that are being addressed in Project Wicked. I think there's also some similarities in some of the stakeholder groups that we've been working with as well. Um, but in the time that I have left, I also wanted to do this quick tour of some of the other work that I've been doing in the urban ecohydrology sphere um, as well. So in urban ecohydrology, one of the things that I'm really fascinated by is uh, just what about the fine scale heterogeneity we see in urban areas really matters for understanding and predicting and managing larger scale urban hydrology. So to explain what I mean when I say fine scale um, heterogeneity, um, I think it helps to think about a house and what happens when it rains on an urban residential parcel. Depending on the decisions that these homeowners and the city and developers have made, a lot of that rain um, may flush directly into storm sewers as runoff. But if the homeowner has uh, disconnected their downspout or the developer sloped walkways to the yard, or the city has mandated a curb strip next to the sidewalk. These may all allow opportunities for water to uh, rainfall to run onto the yard and potentially infiltrate instead. And if the yard's been managed to preserve microtopography, that can lengthen flow paths and increase uh, opportunities for infiltration as well. And of course, uh, depending on how the soil has been managed, um, that's also a strong control over how much water is going to run off for it versus infiltrate once it reaches that yard. And by soil condition here, uh, I mean both soil texture as well as uh, the degree of compaction that it might have experienced due to construction or, or traffic. And so in one of my previous projects, um, I used PAR flow to simulate an urban residential parcel and looked at how low impact practices interact with one another to affect larger scale, in this case, parcel scale hydrology. Um, and the specific low impact practices that I was interested in are the ones that I just mentioned. Uh, so these include several ways of disconnecting impervious surfaces, which has traditionally met our focus in urban hydrology, um, as well as ways of uh, affecting the condition of the pervious surfaces, the yard as well. Um, and I was most interested in how these practices uh, reduce runoff, of course, uh, but also increase uh, evapotranspiration or potentially increased deep drainage, um, which I was defining as the amount of water that makes it past the root zone and can ultimately uh, turn into a groundwater recharge. So I ran a 
nearly 100 scenarios looking at all possible combinations of these practices and also comparing this to the hydrology of a vacant lot. And what I ultimately show here is that it's these interfaces between uh, impervious and pervious areas that matter the most. Um, uh, more specifically, perhaps it's these lateral transfers of water um, from impervious surfaces to pervious green space um, that can create hot spots of infiltration that are strong enough to really drive larger scale hydrology as well. And to leverage uh, the potential power of these in interfaces, it's important to both disconnect impervious surfaces, but also increase the permeability of these pervious areas or, or yard spaces. And the framework from this paper has been uh, a launch point for me for several other um, research questions as well. Um, so one of these is a deeper dive into uh, exactly what is an effective and efficient way to increase that permeability of, of yards and green spaces. Um, so I looked at when and where soil amendment is uh, particularly effective as a low impact practice. Um, I've also looked at how these low impact practices interact with climate, uh, particularly how we can predict where increases in infiltration might ultimately result in more increases in evapotranspiration, where they might ultimately lead to more increases in groundwater recharge, or where you might get both benefits um, from these types of practices. Um, I've also uh, been working on expanding the insights from some of these, you know, kind of intense physically based models um, using statistical models to help highlight um, scale up to kind of the city scale and highlight which areas within a city might be most vulnerable. And, and currently, one of the projects that I'm working on um, with a really great grad student, Aaron Alexander, uh, as well as Steve Lohide and Dan Wright at UW Madison. Uh, is incorporating these key hydrologic processes into a much larger scale land surface models, such as NOAA MP, um, which is used with the National Water Model, some of you may be familiar with. It's also often coupled with an atmospheric model, WARF. Um, and these large land surface models, um, uh, they, they just, they, uh, due to sc uh, scale and size, they tend to boil down all these interesting complexities about our urban environment into a single land use. It's just an urban land use type. If you wanna get a little bit fancy with these models, you can represent multiple land use types within a single grid square, um, such as agriculture or forest, but those urban land use types are, are it's still consigned to just that single land use. And so what we've been working on is adding in additional urban land use types to NOAA MP um, with a focus on these aspects of the complex urban environment that can substantially alter urban water and energy balances due to these lateral transfers of both water, but also energy in this case. And so we're now at this point where we um, can represent um, uh, urban areas using this mosaic of different urban land use types um, that are capturing these lateral transfers of water um, and, and uh, allow us to better investigate um, the, the effects of manipulating these different types of transfers via adding greening or different types of green infrastructure and changing the balance there. Um, and so looking ahead, where we're going with this is coupling NOAA MP, this land surface model, with atmospheric model WARF. Um, which will allow us to uh, look at a number of scenarios, um, in our case in Milwaukee, and look at how uh, massively greening this area, adding a lot of green roofs, uh, more trees, deep paving areas, uh, can not only help uh, reduce urban runoff and potentially mitigate urban flooding risks, uh, but also through interactions with the atmosphere, uh, potentially mitigate extreme heat and even heavy rainfall, um, which can be particularly concerning um, in coastal areas due to these feedbacks with the atmosphere. So um, as I'm looking forward to joining UD next semester uh, in January, um, some of the things that are on my mind, I'm thinking about new ways to scale up these impacts of fine scale urban hydrologic processes. Um, I'm interested in thinking about how the performance of infiltration based stormwater management uh, might change in the context of sea level or groundwater rise. Um, 
I have this longstanding interest in moving beyond the types of projects I've been doing where I'm trying to identify what's the best hydrologic approach um, and, and trying to link those interventions with what people will actually do um, to, to make better management recommendations. And of course, I'm very interested in continuing to uh, forge connections with managers and practitioners um, and continuing this uh, kind of co-productive science that um, I've found really valuable in my current position as a fellow. And I'm uh, looking forward to more discussions with many of you um, uh, as well. And I, I'd be really interested to hear if anything I've touched on today sparks ideas for you as well. So I'll wrap up here by thanking uh, the funding and collaborators and partners, especially the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and Wisconsin Water Resources Institute. And at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Great, thanks, Carolyn. Yeah, Via virtual hand. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was great. Uh, questions, anyone? You can either type them in the chat and I'll look for them or just raise your hand. Jeanette. Hi, Carolyn. Thanks for a great talk. I especially loved all of your beautiful graphics and the, the animations that sort of make points as we go along. And I thought that was super effective. Um, I was just thinking um, here in Delaware, our natural resources agency is called DENREC. It's the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. And at Denon, we've had an internship program we, where, whereby you know, Denric poses a problem and we connect a student to work on that. It's small, but it's been in place since 2011. But I was really intrigued by the, you know, a postdoctoral fellowship, the postdoctoral fellowship program and how that allows someone to, to really go into depth. But, so that's a preamble to my question, which is, because you were working with your agency sort of closely, what was the, how did that go when, when, when you delivered your results? And then what, what was that arc where they, you know, it's now in the hands of the legislator, because that's very exciting when someone's work can actually, you know, go to help decision makers and make evidence-based policy. And so I would just be curious about that, that bridge. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's definitely a, a really meaningful um, component um, of this and, and part that I really enjoyed um, about this project. So, um, uh, so I, uh, I think all of us who are working on it would say that um, uh, me coming in with more of the university researcher mindset, more of an academic mindset, um, uh, the way that we ultimately ended up approaching this project is different than how I would have come in with that mindset. And I think it was different than how they were approaching it coming from, you know, very focused on what the stakeholder kind of um, pinch points uh, had been in previous discussions. Um, and I think we, we both agree very strongly that um, that ultimately the way that we approach this uh, was was better for that in terms of making sure that it was more scientifically rigorous, um, but also very in tune with what they knew from all of their experience was going to be pinch points with these stakeholders. Um, so it was definitely very beneficial in that sense. I'd say uh, on a day to day basis, uh, as I was working on this. Um, it's it's it seemed different from a traditional postdoc or, or academic research project in that I was spending probably half of my time thinking about communication. Uh, you know, half the time I was working on the science, but half the time it was a lot about communication and how are we going to communicate these complicated things to stakeholders um, in ways that you know acknowledging their their prior beliefs about some of these things because there's very strong opinions about them, um, but kind of walking them along and showing them this is a little bit more complex and here's how we've been approaching it there were a lot of conversations about that kind of communication. And that's ultimately where these animations came from. You know, one, one of those sticking points in particular was this idea that there's a static lake level. There's a lake level that's good and there's anything below it is bad. <laughs> and that's just not the way that lakes work, especially seepage lakes can have quite a bit, you know, several feet um, of variability and that's natural. That's just due to uh, the way that they respond. And so, uh, that, that was one of the things that took us the longest to figure out how to communicate. Um, and, and we ended up doing it through those animations, uh, which have, have uh, had a, a good reception. People really appreciated them um, uh, and felt like they understood what we were trying to tell them through, through these graphics. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I 
it's probably a bit of a, a ramble, but it, it's definitely been a really interesting experience for me. I feel like I, I've learned a lot about um, what's going through um, these managers at GNR's heads when they're thinking about what science they need and um, how they tackle it um, and, and how they keep good, maintain good relationships with all their stakeholders. Um, so it, it is now in, um, at least the idea of this water use district is definitely now in the legislat uh, legislature's hands. Um, and we're not sure yet what's going to come of that. But, um, you know, as I'm wrapping up this, this, this project, um, all, what the main focus is, well, okay, so how are we going to implement this into a more streamlined process so that it is affecting the day-to-day -day when they get that high cap application? What are they gonna do differently now that we know what we know? And that's, that's definitely very rewarding. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Other questions? Jane. Oh. Kent, did you want to say? Okay, Jing. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Kent, for letting me go first. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, hi, Caroline. Uh, super engaging uh, talk. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question or oh, many ideas popping up, but I'm uh, going to ask the first one first. Um, for the uh, project, you looked at the uh, urban land use um, effects. You mentioned you also looked at how the effects of changing uh, the arrangement um, at micro scale would interact with uh, climate change. I wonder if we use like see the scale of climate change as a benchmark, what percentage of that could be, um, I guess, adjusted or improved by the the engineering solutions you you, uh, you tested. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that project, um, the, the way that I approached it was I was looking at, um, I didn't look at climate change explicitly, but I was, I used kind of 50 cities across the US to look at how, uh, which kind of covered a, a range of growing season conditions um, to look at how these infiltration based practices, you know, all of them somehow reduce runoff. But then what happens when you increase infiltration? Does it increase ET? Does it increase groundwater recharge? Does it do some mix of both? Um, and so one of the things that we saw there is um, a little bit contrary to some kind of traditional engineering um, design thought, um, you know, in the traditional thinking, we focus a lot on rainfall intensity um, and kind of all these storm characteristics as predictors of performance. Um, and those do matter at the event scale. But when we were thinking a little bit more long term, like how is this shifting in a little bit bigger way, the water balance? Um, what's the potential there? Are we moving water to evapotranspiration and maybe um, uh, able to better realize some cooling benefits from these practices? Are we moving water to groundwater recharge? And maybe able to um, increase recharge um, um, and, and get those benefits. Uh, and when we're looking at these longer time scales, those storm um, characteristics are not important in kind of predicting um, the effects of these infiltration-based practices. What we found was more important is looking at the um, balance the, of uh, potential evapotranspiration and precipitation, um, like a PET to P ratio, as well as how well they're correlated over 30 days and the intermittency of precipitation. Um, and so uh, this could be a good next step would be to kind of say, okay, so we used you know, 50 cities, uh, one year uh, simulations across 50 cities to kind of quickly get at what are these controlling factors, uh, a good next step. And I think an interesting place to go would be, okay, so given, given this, what do we expect is gonna happen with climate change in a particular city? Uh, which, uh, you know, how, is, um, how should we expect the performance of these to change over time, given um, what climate change means for some of those um, predictive uh, climate metrics? I hope cool. that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have one quick follow up. Uh, yeah. Because you, you mentioned you looked at 50 cities across uh, the country. I wondered if you see the effect, uh, much difference in the effects. So, are the effects of these um, solutions similar for different cities or do they vary? If they vary, is it primarily driven by size of cities or features of cities or? Um, I guess, features of the environment, like if they're coastal or inland or in different climate zones or something like that. Yeah, we could definitely uh, uh, look at a little bit more complex um, 
uh, investigation of kind of how these cities are different in other ways, we only looked at how they were different in terms of weather. So that was the only uh, variable that we're looking at. But weather alone uh, is a very strong driver in terms of what to expect. There are many cities where what we were seeing was primarily these infiltration based um, practices increase groundwater recharge and that's kind of all they do you almost never see um, a benefit to ET or a potential increase in kind of the cooling benefits of some of these practices and that would be like uh, around um, uh, the mid-Atlantic area those are some the mid-Atlantic kind of the Midwest um, those are some areas where these practices are really the only benefit uh, you're not getting that cooling benefit you can only really expect the increase in in um, groundwater recharge whereas other cities um, you are at the opposite extreme. These were really only increasing evapotranspiration. Um, there's very few actually places actually where we are seeing both benefits um, and that co-benefit. Um, so uh, yeah, you could uh, look at this in a you know do do the next level of analysis and kind of add in some things uh, that are are also characteristic of cities like how these parcel layouts might be a little bit different because of zoning regulations across different cities um, or, or things of that nature, kind of like what you were talking about. Uh, but from the weather alone perspective, there's quite a range. <laughs> it goes to both extremes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Kent, did you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I did. Uh, my first comment was, was great, Carolyn. It was really wonderful to hear you talk. And I, I echo Jeanette's um, you know, praise for your graphics. Those were really cool. And they even let an economist understand what you were doing. So that's really cool. So thanks. Um, I wonder if you could speak to me about those scenarios a bit on agricultural uh, pumping. Uh, of ir for irrigation water. I mean, you, you take the extremes of, you know, basically no irrigation or imagine everything is irrigated. And then you say, well, here's the current status. What is difficult for me to understand is, you know, it, kind of by, by its nature, you think, well, that's kind of a, a midpoint, you know, 50% of the land is, is there. And maybe you showed that there, but like, I, I didn't see it. Like, you know, is the current status, you know, 20%? So there's another 80% that could go to irrigated. Um, or are we almost at 80% right now? And so to go from, you know, the current uh, status quo to where it is, um, is, is a relatively small change. Um, th that would be helpful for me to understand how far, you know, what we're in. So yeah, that picture, I guess, right? Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, the Central Sands is an area where uh, a lot of the development has been happening. So there, it is um, relative to the rest of the state. There, it is pretty built out in terms of irrigated agriculture. A lot of the places that could be irrigated ag, and uh, so there's uh, one of our colleagues um, had, had done a, a uh, investigation trying to figure out, you know, based on soil types and slopes and where other places had been converted to ag, what kind of care, what types of areas um, made good. Um, could potentially be converted to irrigated ag, um, and and so yeah, there's I don't I don't know the exact percentages off the top of my head about how much is already developed and how much could be, but visually this is what we're looking at. So it's not that 100% of this area could be um, irrigated agriculture. Um, it's it's something less than that. Um, but um, yeah, I would say in terms of thinking about. Um, what we saw then from the lake ecosystem response, um, uh, a lot of the impact is already there with yeah. uh, current irrigated ag. It can get worse, uh, but a lot of the impact was already there. So for example, I want to say something like, um, you know, the, the average level at Long Lake, I think, declines by something like don't quote me on this, but it declines, but just give you an idea, it declines by something like 3.3 feet due to current irrigated ag, and the potential irrigated ag could reduce it by another half a foot or so. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I guess each one of these, I mean, you know, you'd even want to dig down a little bit into the watersheds of, or the groundwater shed or whatever it is for the lake, right? I mean, you have certain areas that might already, uh, around those lakes that may have heterogeneity like you know long lake may already be pretty well developed out for irrigation versus these other lakes maybe where the real threat would be right yes uh, yes for sure mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um my final question on that is just a, this scenario which is is does the state have any sense of 
the actual pumping that's existing? Are there meters on these um, and are they reported annually or uh, yeah. monthly or how, how's what's the reporting on that? Yeah, it's it's somewhat new. I think it's in 2011 is when they started requiring pumping data. So we can't go farther back than 2011 to, to get at numbers, but they do um, get, uh, it's monthly data that gets reported. Um, and there's definitely some concerns about how accurate it is. We've done some um, studies trying to figure out, you know, are people over-reporting? Do people tend to under-report? And I, if I remember right, I think the consensus is people people do both, thinking they're gaming the system. <laughs> um, but uh, but and so there's some corrective factors that uh, that um, some of my colleagues have looked into for trying to adjust to be a little bit more accurate. Um, that's the data that we used in order to calibrate the mod flow model, trying to make sure that we were um, um, uh, predicting and kind of simulating pumping correctly. We use that data to calibrate it. And we also tuned the soil water balance model um, and adjusted um, how that was working so that it was lining up better with what uh, the pumping data we have um, indicates. Um, so yes, some, some data, some uncertainty about how, exactly how accurate it is, but it was definitely really important that we were using it in this study um, and, and, um, and tuning our models so that they were matching that as best we could. Thanks. Yeah. Can, I follow up on, can I just follow up on that, Michael, real quick? Yeah. Um, so I was gonna ask a similar thing to Kent because it looks like your um, current and potential on this slide, or yeah. maybe like twice as much. But like you said, the plots that you showed with the three the three lines, the the two current and potential are almost the same. Yeah. So I was wondering, is it just that the lakes that you chose are because because there's a spatial component? It's kind of like that strip in the middle, of the current. Yeah. Atmosphere. Is that where the lakes are, or is it because of where the lakes are relative to where the expansion of irrigated agriculture would be? Yeah. Yeah. It that is. So we we didn't really have a say in which lakes we could, the lakes that we could look at were very prescribed. So we had to use those three and we could only look at those three lakes in this study based on the way that the statue was um, described. And yes, they, Long and Plainfield Lake, for example, are right in here uh, where it is mostly built out. I think Pleasant Lake is a little bit farther down. There might've been a little bit more potential for expansion nearby that lake. Um, yes, so that, that, that does contribute to the current and the potential uh, response being similar for these three lakes. Gotcha. Michael, yep. you're, you're up. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. That's great. Um, I was really intrigued by the, the wide variability that you showed in, in lake levels over time. You know, having grown up in Wisconsin, I had no clue they would vary that much. Um, and it got me wondering about, you know, long-term trends in lake levels, maybe on the order of, you know, 20 to 100 years. Um, and I don't even know if there's, you know, good data um, on that. But I'm just thinking of my experiences poking around a bit with precipitation data in the Wisconsin, the Midwest. It seems like, um, at least in the last few decades, there's been increases in precipitation, especially in the wintertime. Um, and it got me kind of wondering about, um, you know, the sustainability of, of this veggie production region in Wisconsin. Um, wondering if, we, if there really indeed is this trend towards increasing you know, precipitation in this area. Is there a reason for a little bit of optimism you know, that we can have these straws poking into the, the water table? In the yeah, future. that's a great question. So um, try, trying to limit the scope of this study, because it was definitely nowhere in the statute, we explicitly did not think about or even really touch climate change and how that might be affecting this. We did look at a long period of time, this 38 year record, because when we were looking at kind of how long it takes for some of the lake level metrics that we were interested in to stabilize, it takes several decades because you have to go through, you know, these, these cycles of highs and lows in the past, you know, have something like decadal um, cycles. So you needed a couple decades to, um, to get some reasonable estimate of some of these lake level metrics, even without <laughs> thinking about what, what um, changing climate might be doing to them. Uh, but one of the, I will say one of the interesting things about this study <laughs> is that the two years that we had to collect field data on these lakes were record high water levels everywhere. So we're trying to study <laughs> what happens when the water levels are too low on these lakes and it's levels that have never been seen <laughs> before. Um, so that is a really, 
I think, interesting question. We did not try to go down that that direction yet, um, but uh, and, and water levels since then, since say 2020, they've been starting to come back down a little bit. But that was definitely the um, the the biggest uh, the the highest highs that we've seen have been in the last few years. So it's it's definitely an interesting question to think about what we should expect in the future if we're just going to see kind of more extreme cycles, uh, if things are all going to be generally a little bit higher, but the same kinds of oscillations. Um, I don't know. I think that's a good question. I have a question. First off, great talk. Welcome to UD. I think you're gonna you know do well and, and like it here as well. So my question has to do with the increased pumping. Does this model include things like changes in soil and aquifers that are, you know, caused when you pump a lot more water, like compaction and, you know, reduced volume of storage? No, I do not think so. Um, okay. And yeah, um, yeah, the soil water balance, I know too, you know, we, the, in order the kinds of things that you can adjust in order to better match the pumping data are things like, you know, the um, crop planting date and things like that. So you're playing with kind of the phenology of the crops to try to adjust the water that soil water balance is estimating is going to be pumped for irrigation to the records that we actually have. Um, so there's definitely, I mean, that's that's kind of one example. There are, there are other ways in which um, uh, our model could have been a little more sophisticated in order to mm -hmm. account for some of these other things that are probably also going to happen when you're thinking about groundwater withdrawals and human impacts. Um, but, but yeah, that, that was what we had to work with. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, any last burning questions before we wrap up? Okay, well, we're just about at noon. Thanks so much, Carolyn. That was really great. And I look forward to working with you. Yeah, thanks again for having me. It was great to, to meet you all. I'm looking forward to seeing you in a couple months. <laughs>